The 1970s was an interesting transitional decade for the automotive world. While there were incredible leaps forward in technical sophistication and reliability and performance, new emissions and safety regulations, especially here in the States, affected every kind of vehicle. But it especially made it difficult for those manufacturers wishing to make compelling sports cars. Of course, performance takes a hit when you completely smother your engine, but as the specs and stats for a sports car matters, the way that it looks might actually matter even more. It wasn't as though the 70s hit and suddenly people started caring about safety. Seatbelts were becoming common in cars at this point. Car design as a whole was changing to better protect drivers and passengers with things like crumple zones. Steering columns were no longer gigantic spears waiting to turn you into a skew in the event of a head-on collision, but it wasn't until 1968 with the creation of the DOT and later National Highway Traffic Safety Administration that many of the common safety standards that we take for granted today became, well, standard. Things like shoulder harnesses, for example. Some would argue that these safety standards did have an effect on the overall design of cars, You know, long gone were those beautiful metal dashes, for example, as well as true knockoff wire wheels. But these changes were pretty minimal, and the regulators hadn't considered major changes to the outside of the car yet in terms of overall safety. Prior to the 1970s, bumpers served one main purpose, to preserve the body of the car in the case of a minor accident. As with all functional pieces of the car though, over time aesthetics became more important and chrome became the material of choice for bumpers. Through the 50s and 60s, the bumper would become a key part of the car's exterior design. As vehicles became more streamlined and flowing, the form of bumpers followed. Sometimes this meant only having half of a bumper. Form began to trump function, You know, look no further than the C1 and C2 Corvettes and the ways in which the simple slim chrome bumpers fit seamlessly with the rest of the chrome on the car. Or note the dainty front and rear chrome bumpers on the curvaceous Jaguar E-Type. Protection of any kind obviously wasn't the purpose here. Sure, these bumpers are a key reason why cars from the 50s and 60s look so good. I mean, at the time, Lamborghini just apparently scoffed at the idea of bumpers. And then government happened. Remember I mentioned the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or the NHTSA? Well, at the end of 1972, that group decided that it was time to change this whole bumper meta with a regulation known as Safety Standard Number 215. This specific regulation addressed front and rear bumper efficacy with a new requirement for front bumpers to be able to withstand impact of 5 miles per hour with pretty much no damage. You know, it had to basically not damage things like the headlights. And the rear impact was 2.5 miles per hour, also with virtually no damage. And what is meant by damage also isn't just exterior, it's also things like the fueling and cooling and braking systems. Basically, the idea was that with these more minimal accidents, these new bumpers wouldn't leave the car dysfunctional, making it so that hit and runs could be easier. Wait, what? But from a manufacturer's standpoint, this makes things pretty difficult. How do they accomplish this without ruining the look of their cars? It should be noted that many vehicles on the road in 1972 already met these standards, but sports cars in particular, with their smaller bodies and more compact mechanics, plus, you know, small stylish bumpers, well, they didn't meet the standards. So the major manufacturers found that there was really only one solution, rubber. By the 1970s, rubber was an important thing, unless you were at Woodstock. For manufacturers needing to change their bumpers to meet these new regulations, which would soon be changed to make rear bumpers also able to withstand 5 mile per hour impacts as well, utilizing rubber was really the way to go. American manufacturers really worked hard to integrate the new bumpers into their designs. Haggerty's awesome article on this topic rightly points out that the 74 Corvette C3 is probably the best integration at this time. I would also note that the Italian manufacturers were able to make them work pretty well as well as they were moving more to wedge designs at this time, and the rubber bumpers kind of fit with that. But many of the other non-American manufacturers took a different approach and decided to just kind of slap on these thick rubber bumpers. Hmm like BMW, and oh god, Mercedes. Why? By 1976, the venerable Datsun Z series had went from looking like this to this. 
Fiat's new bumper stuck out about a foot from the car, but as it is with making breakfast and speaking the English language, the Brits did it worst. I'm kidding, guys. I'm kidding. Chill out. I know this is coming from a guy who used to say Jaguar, but I do make good breakfast. Without a doubt, when you think of bad rubber bumper cars from the 70s, you think of one British manufacturer, and that is MG. Iconic 1960s models like the MGB and the Midget with their classic, beautiful, minimalistic styling, known for being lightweight sports cars with incredible handling, and then this happened. No other manufacturer had a lineup so changed in overall look like MG. A rubber bumper midget just looks completely different than a chrome bumper one. This is because, as much as they were ugly, and a far cry from their former self, cars like the midget and B in rubber bumper form were really an attempt at fully integrating this idea. Some people think they just slapped them on, and that really wasn't the case. The bumpers were large, but they were shaped in such a way that they oddly fit with the car, and if you hadn't seen the previous chrome bumper versions, you might not find them as ugly. But coupled with a significant increase in ride height, again to fit new standards, it felt as though these great little sports cars were just now so far from their great roadster heritage. All of this combined with the necessary extra metalwork to hold the bumpers in meant an increase of over 100 pounds for cars like the MGB, and altogether the cars themselves as a whole suffered. They didn't handle as well, the front anti-roll bar was deleted, killing the MGB's characteristic, nimble, confidence-inspiring handling. MG's cars not only looked weird now, they were literally functioning worse because of all these regulations. Now a broader question is, did the rubber bumper epidemic kill the British sports car? I mean, it certainly didn't help matters, but one can't help but note the explosion of the Japanese sports car around this time, so it really can't be blamed for this. Again though, it didn't help. In May of 1977, the NHTSA did an assessment of their ongoing safety standards, including this new front and rear bumper requirements. And what they found was that low-speed front and rear accidents, especially in bigger cities for some reason, resulted in lower maintenance costs. But they also resulted in slightly higher costs for those accidents in excess of 14 miles per hour. Now what's interesting is the whole focus of this discussion back in the 70s, it was really centered around costs, as much as people think it's primarily about safety. The rubber epidemic really had nothing to do with passenger safety, as they didn't really benefit you in the case of a more serious accident. So if they served their purpose, why did they go away? And you could also ask a broader question, what happened to bumpers in general? If rubber defined bumper technology through the 70s, then plastic would define the 80s, and, well, every decade going forward for automotive technology pretty much. A few things happened in the 1980s. Changes in standards made it so that front and rear bumpers only needed to withstand 2.5 mile per hour crashes, and the industry as a whole adopted Pontiac's plastic bumper setup for its manufacturing and crash and fuel efficiency benefits. Oh, and there's the unspoken change, shown in the fact that they lowered the mile per hour you know, crash requirements, regulators stopped giving a crap about the expenses associated with crashes and pretty much only focused on safety. And over time, it appeared as though bumpers pretty much disappeared. When in reality, as car bodies became plastic all around, manufacturers figured out how to integrate their bumpers into the overall design to pretty much hide their existence. Interestingly enough, with our move away from traditional bumpers, we're now in the completely opposite place as where we were trying to go in the 70s. Regulators could not care less about the potential costs associated with a small fender bender today. With expensive painted plastics and electronics housed right there, just waiting to be smashed to bits with pretty much zero protection, average bumper repair costs for these small fender bender claims today are probably over $2,000. In that 1977 report, they found that with rubber bumper claims from these same kinds of slow crashes, they were pretty much almost eliminated. If you got into a small little, you know, rear end at, say, 5 miles per hour, everybody just drove away. If you've experienced a slow speed crash in a 70s rubber bumper car, you know what I'm talking about. You literally just kind of bounce off of stuff. 
Today, if you're driving a Tesla, expect closer to 5K or more for a fender bender. And these changes are a big part of the reason why insurance costs so much more today. Sure, the new automotive standards through the 70s forced manufacturers to change what their cars looked like, and thick, ugly bumpers may not be required anymore. Maybe our cars are more aerodynamic and, of course, safer. But cars today also can't look certain ways because of these kinds of safety regulations, and you know, it's up to you whether that's a good thing or not. And as it becomes apparent that the only way to safely traverse our roads anymore is to just have the biggest vehicle possible, so that, say your high schooler is getting their first car, the only way you feel like they're safe is to put them in a gigantic SUV, when in reality you're making them the danger (laughs) on the road. I don't know, I wonder how much better we really are off today. Now, I sadly didn't live through the rubber bumper epidemic. Many of you probably did, and maybe you have a fondness for these cars. When I first got interested in classic cars, I found myself really hating all the rubber bumper versions of all the cars I liked. But honestly, many of them have grown on me, and I have a strange feeling they may even be worth more than their earlier chrome bumper siblings in the future, but who knows. Thanks for watching, guys. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications if you would like to know when I upload and be on the lookout for more automotive history videos. We'll see you guys in the next one. Drive safe.